Hello, and welcome to this week's Hagley History Hangout. At the Hagley Museum and Library, we document the unfolding history of American business and technology and their impact on the world. My name is Michael DiCamillo. I'm a processing archivist at the Hagley, and through this series, we're going to draw on Hagley's extensive research collections and tell you some surprising stories about the past. Today, I'm going to tell you a bit about the work that I do at Hagley's Manuscripts and Archives Division. And then I'm going to share an interesting story with you about a, a labor strike at the General Electric Company that occurred in 1960. The story comes from a collection that I'm currently working on. It's called the Virgil Day Papers. Virgil Day was one of the lead labor negotiators for General Electric from the 1950s through the early 1970s. Mr. Day would meet with the union bosses and they'd hammer out labor contracts for the company's various workers. Day was also appointed to several federal committees to represent the interests of what today we would call big business. Day's committees were often focused on the inflation problem that plagued the US economy in the 60s and 70s. A few years ago, Virgil Day's son donated to the Hagley his father's collection of business papers that were generated mostly during the course of Virgil Day's career at General Electric. The papers include letters and memos, reports and speeches, and a variety of other materials that document Day's career at General Electric. And of course, the papers also document the federal committees that Day participated in. So some of the policies of President Richard Nixon are represented in the collection particularly Nixon's efforts to curb inflation, since Day was a participant in the anti-inflation committees that Nixon created. Now, when a new collection such as the Virgil Day papers arrive at Hagley, the materials often are not yet quite ready for research. They pa the papers often lack a, a meaningful order. So someone may have just thrown the papers and files haphazardly into a box, or maybe the creator of the files wasn't a very good organizer, so his or her files aren't labeled clearly or they're inaccurately labeled. So before researchers can get the materials and start to create history, the boxes first go to a processing archivist, someone like me, and the processing archivist prepares the collections for research. When I receive a new collection, I have to first determine an appropriate order for the papers. So for the Virgil Day collection, I noticed that the papers fell into a few different categories. He had some personal papers, for example. These were things like Christmas cards he had received from friends, poems and quotes that may have been inspiring to him. And there's paperwork related to the upkeep of his home and his personal finances. Then there was another category that I created, his professional papers. These were the materials from his 25-year career at General Electric and the various things he accumulated from his public service work. After I separate the papers into these categories, personal, professional categories, I start to sort each category a bit further. So, for example, in the professional papers, I identified this large collection of speeches and those transcripts went into their own pile, which I started organizing according to subject and date. This processing of sorting goes on until all the papers are arranged and organized in an accessible manner. Some collections, a little bit more complicated to sort than others. In the case of the Virgil Day papers, they were pretty messy. I suspect that when Virgil Day was using these papers, they were probably pretty organized, but after he retired and then passed away and his papers landed with his son and eventually made it to Hagley, they must have just became jumbled moving from location to location. But now at the Hagley, I'm restoring order to them. And as I go, I place the papers into archival quality folders and archival boxes for long-term preservation. Once all of that manual work is complete, I write up a finding aid. 
Now, the finding aid is a document that's going to help researchers and our reference specialists at Hagley understand the arrangement that I created for the collection so they know where they can find specific items and so they know what's actually in the collection. We often place these finding aids online so researchers can read about our collections and their contents prior to coming to the Hagley. If you want to find one of these Hagley finding aids, you can go to our website and I'll walk you through a quick demonstration here. You go to the research tag at the top and click on search collections. Then you scroll down so you find the link to finding aids. Click on the link and I'll take you to a search box where you can search for whatever you're interested in. Now the Virgil Day papers aren't yet online because I'm still working on them, but something I recently processed was the Haskell Laboratory for Toxicology Records. And this is the finding aid. As you scroll down, you'll see there's some descriptive information, but the historical note and the scope and content note, they're the most interesting parts of the finding aid because that gives you all the background on the who and the what and gives you a box by box, folder by folder breakdown of all the materials that are in the collection. Once the finding aid is finished, then researchers have access to the collection and they can start reconstructing the data and the stories in the collection and ultimately use that information in their classrooms or their books or their documentary films, all the places where we learn history. Now, let's get back to those Virgil Day papers, the collection I'm currently processing. We don't have time today to examine the entire collection, but we can look at one event. And so today I want to share that story with you. The story of the International Union of Electrical Workers strike against General Electric in 1960. It's interesting because it serves as a little bit of a window into uh, Virgil Day's economic philosophy as well as the philosophy that the folks at General Electric shared with him. And ultimately, we can see that this philosophy of Virgil Day and the practices at General Electric had a pretty profound impact on labor relations in the United States down the road. Now, as I mentioned before, Virgil Day, he's responsible for General Electric's labor relations from 1950 through the early 70s. Day's boss in the early years of that span was a man named Lemuel Bulware. Now, Bulware was a man that Day greatly admired and saw as a mentor, and these two worked very closely together and shared a lot of the same thoughts and ideas. Bulware is the originator of a lot of this thought, though, and his approach to labor relations would eventually revolutionize how companies and unions negotiated. But when he first starts rolling out these philosophies, they're pretty controversial. And unions, they would do all they could to combat what they saw as unfair attempts to suppress wages and benefits at General Electric. So this is why we find ourselves in the summer of 1960. Day, Bulware, and their team of General Electric negotiators, they're preparing for battle against the boss of the International Union of Electrical Workers, a man named James Carey. Now, in that summer of 1960, there were about 70,000 General Electric workers who were members of Carey's International Union of Electrical Workers, which going forward now we'll call the IUE. Now this 70,000 General Electric workers who are in the IUE, that's not everyone working at General Electric. This is a, a key point. There are various unions in place at General Electric. And workers also had the option to not join a union at all. But the IUE, they are one of the more significant unions at General Electric. And that's why there are these looming power struggles that are on the horizon here and a lot of uncertainty in places where there were concentrations of IUE workers. 
GE had plants all around the country, but the IUE was concentrated in plants such as Trenton, Cleveland, and Schenectady, New York. Schenectady was particularly important. About 9,000 workers in the IUE worked in Schenectady. So the decisions at that plant were going to influence workers and management across the, across the company. In the summer of 1960, the average IUE worker earned about $2.30 an hour. That's the rate of pay that was guaranteed by the current contract. In 2019 dollars, that's $19.87 an hour. So roughly about $41,000 per year in 2019 money. That puts these workers at the bottom of the middle class. They're getting by, their basic needs are covered, but they don't have much room for error and certainly little opportunity for largesse. Unfortunately for everyone, this current contract was going to expire at the end of September, thus this looming labor battle. Negotiations between the union leaders and the company executives, they're underway, but they are not very productive. In fact, there are some memos and news clippings in the Virgil Day papers that indicate that one of the meetings in the summer ended in an explosion of expletives and other foul language after only gathering together for a little more than an hour's time. These negotiations, they're a slog. Finally, at the end of the summer, General Electric puts an offer on the table. The company, they viewed this offer as very fair. But union boss Kerry, he didn't see it that way. He blasts the offer. He says it fails to address the most important issues for the union. Now, by industry standards, the offer isn't terrible, but it isn't impressive either. It's very average. The contract offered the average employee a 7% wage increase. That's gonna gradually roll out over three years. So by the end of the contract, the average worker would have received a raise totaling about 16 cents. That's $1.38 in today's, <clears throat> in today's money. The offer maintained other benefits from the previous contract. So workers would still get seven paid holidays. They're gonna get one to two weeks vacation time, depending on their years of service, an insurance policy, and a small pension plan that the employees contribute to. No one was really arguing any of the inclusions in the company's offer. It was the subtractions that were causing these hot summer meetings to explode into uh, swearing and cursing. The company's offer, it's going to cut something the union saw as very critical. There are a lot of fears of inflation growing in the 1960s, as I mentioned earlier. And this expiring contract had a cost of living clause. Now, the cost of living clause would escalate wages automatically as inflation occurred. And it would be in addition to any other yearly contractual increases. So you get your cost of living uh, escalator as inflation goes up, but you're still entitled to your guaranteed raises that were in the contract. The new contract cuts the cost of living escalator. This is why James Carey is so upset. They charge that cutting the cost of living escalator negates any pay increases in the new offer since inflation is going to swallow up that 7% gain. Inflation is going to remain a big concern for years to come. Now Carey, he believes the company can do better. He goes on television, holds a press conference to press his position, and he states, the cost of living clauses in contracts were critical to protect wage gains. He also presses that the company needed to provide better job security. In 1960, automation was already starting to reduce the need for human laborers. We hear that sort of talk still today through discussions about artificial intelligence. That conversation had already began by 1960. 
In addition, corporate executives were starting to look overseas and they were seeing that there was cheap labor available in developing countries. Another thing that we still hear talked about today. So Kerry in 1960, he's demanding job security clauses in the new contract. He wants to protect his workers from job loss due to automation or foreign competition. So Kerry asks for severance pay and unemployment insurance that General Electric would have to pay out if they were to get rid of employees. So these devices, they're designed to make mass layoffs very expensive for the company and try to deter the company from engaging in mass layoffs. Thus, they were very important to carry to have in the new contract. General Electric, they balk on all of these requests. So they continue to keep the cost of living escalator out of the new contract and they don't build in any of the job security protections that Kerry is asking for. So as the final days of summer come to a close, there's no progress. The company's heels are dug in and Kerry feels he has only one other option left and that's to start threatening a strike. So we have these worry clouds gathering over Schenectady and the other GE plants like Cleveland and Trenton and Philadelphia. Everyone gets worried when James Carey threatens a strike. Strikes are really precarious events for everyone involved. Companies, of course, lose production, but they also face the threat of violence and vandalism should things start to get out of hand. And strikes are also difficult on those who are striking. They lose their paychecks when they're out on strike. And sometimes the union offers a stipend, but it's usually less than the weekly pay. Then of course, there's a lot of worry. Worry over how management is going to react. Is your job gonna remain secure during the strike? And is management gonna treat you differently when the strike ends and you return to the job? Many workers dreaded the talk of the strike. It brings tension into the workplace and it makes everybody uneasy. Of course, workers have the option of crossing the picket line and working despite the strike, but then you face threats of violence from your fellow strikers. There's a lot of social pressure to remain loyal. So this often wasn't an option either. But Kerry is increasing the strike rhetoric as these negotiations are going nowhere and everyone's feeling a little bit queasy. Really, was the company's offer that bad? Taking the offer and staying on the job, it actually appealed to a lot of the workers. We know, in, for example, in Schenectady that many workers preferred not to strike at all. We know this because there are documents in the Virgil Day papers. It indicates that Day and his team hired a research company to take the temperature of the town. So they hired pollsters to telephone workers' homes and ask for their opinions on the company's offer. And the results, it suggested that their workers were not in a striking mood and that they thought the offer was fair. If Kerry did pull the strike lever, Day and Bulware, General Electric, they were pretty confident that Kerry's union members, most importantly in Schenectady where a large majority of the IUE was concentrated, that this strike wouldn't go on for very long. But Kerry wasn't gonna back down. It was a record year for profits at General Electric. Management was certainly doing well. In today's money, General Electric executives were holding down six-figure salaries. They're attending conferences at expensive hotel ballrooms. They're enjoying life luxuries at the wage earners, they're not going to see, even with a 7% increase. Now, the union wasn't asking for chartered planes. They're asking for a little more job security for the employees who are responsible for the company's production increases year after year. And further, and perhaps most important, unions almost always triumphed over companies during this era. 
Unions in the 1950s, they held enormous leverage and companies were routinely awarding their workers record-breaking wage increases. For example, auto manufacturers such as General Motors and, and Chrysler, they had recently given their labor forces large increases and in additional benefits through negotiations with their union, the United Auto Workers Union. The union win at GM, it was touted as one of the largest union wins of all time. Organized labor had come a long way since the end of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century when employers held all the cards and wage earners had to accept minimal pay and deplorable working conditions. So Kerry, he's gonna keep pressing for these job security concessions. But GE, with Bulware and Day, they don't behave like a typical company of this era. The GE way, the Bulware way, the Day way, that meant that GE would stick to its original offer and refuse Carrie's demands. So we get out of the summer, leaves are turning, the weather's cooling, and the October 1st deadline in which the deal needed to be done, it arrives and there's no deal. So Kerry does what he feels he needs to do. He orders a strike. So it becomes up to the, the local unions now. It becomes up to the union locals to decide whether they're going to listen to Kerry and go out on strike or whether they're going to defy Kerry and stay on the job. So the day of decision is the next day, October 2nd. And most workers, they choose to strike. Remember, across the nation, union gains were undeniable. So GE workers felt they had to give Kerry at least a chance to get a little bit of more. And if they could apply a little bit of pressure through this strike, that maybe they could get that bit more. But unfortunately for the IU, IUE strikers, the strike at General Electric is not the crippling blow that strikes often had on a company. See, Day and Bulware, they're a clever bunch. So the walkout of the IUE, it doesn't deplete GE's labor force. GE had protections in place. Remember I said earlier that some General Electric workers were not in a union. GE had resisted what was called the closed shop. Many companies had implemented the closed shop, but GE refuses it. And what it means is that all employees in the closed shop had to be a member of a union in order to be an employee at the company. If you weren't a member of the union, you couldn't work at the closed shop plant. However, GE is a different type of company. They dub themselves a, a, <clears throat> a right to work shop. So GE workers have the right to choose if they want to join a union. They didn't have to be part of the union to work at GE. So on the morning of October 2nd, any non-union workers simply went to work. They were paid on separate terms. The expired contract didn't really affect them. Another factor playing into uh, the, the striking IU members, another factor that was hurting the striking IU, IUE members was that a number of different unions were in operation at GE. So the sheet metal workers, they had their own union and machinists had their own union. There were even multiple unions for electrical workers. So some electrical workers were members of a different union and they worked under their union's contract. So all of these workers also showed up for work on the morning of October 2nd. This fragmentation was by design GE wanted multiple unions and they resisted the closed shop because it worked in their favor. It made this unified complete strike very difficult to achieve. You just can't get, you just can't get General Electric on the ropes. So a few days drag by in the strike and, and the tensions are worsening because a press war starts to ramp up. GE starts taking out advertisements in local newspapers, attempting to discredit Kerry 
They want to position him as a leader of a terror squad, trying to scare its members into a strike that the union members really didn't want. Kerry, of course, is going to counterattack in the press, and he insists that GE is throwing out propaganda, trying to spin the truth, and that the offer was really lackluster. So the first week of the strike passes by, and the strikers miss their first payday. And when that first payday is missed, patience in the ranks begins fraying. Bills need to be paid, and remember, these folks who are on strike, they're often living paycheck to paycheck. In Schenectady, the union local leaders, they start suggesting it's time to defy Kerry and drop the strike and return to work. They don't have much faith that Kerry's gonna get much more out of General Electric. And they can see that GE has no interest in budging. So they're convinced the company's offer, it's not exciting, but it's fair. And loyalty to Kerry in Schenectady starts to weaken. As the strike drags on into two weeks, Schenectady workers, not interested in missing more paychecks, they quit the picket, they return to work with no new deal in hand. It's a tacit acceptance of the company's offer. Now, because Schenectady has such a large number of IUE workers, the break at that plant really weakens the strike in all the cities. When the workers start returning to work in droves, they're just not going to hold out for something that the company isn't going to be giving, particularly now that such a large portion of their strikers had quit the picket. They're gonna lose that cost of living increase and they're not gonna get job protections that they hope to get, but they need to put food on the table. They need to pay the rent. Carrie has to capitulate. And this is unique because this is an era when companies generally conceded to union demands and here's General Electric. They break the tie, they break the strike. How did Bulware and Day do it? The answer seems to be in the Virgil B. Day papers. Remember, I said that the collections, letters, and memos, and other reports, it outlines the philosophy and strategies that Bulware and Day used and implemented during this negotiation and many others. When Lemuel Bulware and, and Virgil Day are hired to oversee General Electric labor relations, General Electric is really like any other company. They're consistently bowing down to union demands. Now, I want to be clear here. Many of these gains for workers in the, in the 30s and the 40s, they're justified. The rise of unions and organized labor in, in the late 30s and into the 40s, it writes an imbalance in the worker-employer relationship, which had unquestionably favored employers since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution in the, the mid-1800s. You know, prior to organized labor. We have tragedies such as the Triangle Factory Fire of 1911. Gruesome deaths, 146 garment workers. Wage earners, they're dealing with inadequate pay, harsh working conditions, company policies that are just draconian. That's what the norm is for the wage earner. Companies always defeat any attempts that workers made to organize in any attempt to improve their conditions. But things change in the 1930s. First, there's the passage of the Wagner Act in 1935. And with that, labor reform really starts to happen. The Wagner Act granted workers the right to collective bargaining. It also established the National Labor Relations Board. And that would make sure that the old practices of blacklisting and aggressive strike breaking and discriminatory firings, those things could no longer occur. So this act really enables unions to fully organize and union members could not be fired simply for joining a union and union leaders, they start to take the lead on the guaranteed collective bargaining. With unified workers, legally permitted strikes, required collective bargaining, workers are starting to even the score. Then World War II hits, and there's sudden labor shortages, 
and an increased demand for production. So now labor finds itself in a really advantageous position. Unions capitalize on the circumstances. And that's why through the 1940s, they're winning big gains for their members. So a company like General Electric found itself looking for someone with some new ideas to direct its labor relations in 1947. Someone who understood the changing dynamic between the company and the worker. So for GE, that meant hiring Lemuel Bulware. Bulware's previous experience wasn't in labor relations though. It was in marketing. But he sold the company on the idea that marketing principles were important to change the nature of the labor game in this new world. So first, Lem said, the companies need to know their labor markets. So he determined to use research to figure out some things. Market research for Lem meant going to figure out what employees really wanted from their jobs. What was going to make them the most happy? Also, he wanted to know what's the competition paying their employees? What are other industries paying their employees? All of this would go into his market research. He'd also try to determine what the company could truly afford because they had stockholders to please. They needed to reinvest some of the profits into the company for new ideas and new products. So Lem would develop this market report where he knew what people really wanted from their jobs and what sort of pay made the most sense in the marketplace. Then, continuing on with his marketing strategy, Lem said the next step here is to make sure you create an appealing product. He viewed jobs as products that needed to be sold to the potential workers. So the potential workers were his customers in a way, and the products he, he was creating were the compensation packages of the jobs. So he wanted to create an appealing product while also staying within the boundaries of the marketplace that his market research had established. Third, and perhaps most important to Lem, was he wanted to teach his workers business and economic principles. He wanted them to understand the company's position in the marketplace. So that meant he went about teaching his workers the connection between employee wages and product prices. This is a time of a global marketplace emerging and foreign competition is challenging American manufacturing. And Lemuel Bulware wanted his employees to know that cheap wages in Japan meant Japanese companies could offer lower prices on their products. But if American wages were rising at a rate that was out of proportion, American companies would necess necessarily need to raise their product prices, matching inflated wages with inflated prices. So he wanted to caution his employees that these unchecked wage increases would be disastrous for the worker and the company because the company is gonna lose business to the competition and subsequently they're going to have to shed jobs. Now, how did he go about teaching this message? Well. He used employee newsletters that laid out his economic principles. He put pamphlets inside of pay envelopes that also laid out economic principles. He hung posters on factory walls. Lem used every marketing device that he could, that he could think of to illustrate these economic philosophies that he believed governed the profits of the company and ultimately led to wages. For Lem, this education was an all-year obligation, not something that he ramped up at negotiation time, but something that went on all year. So when negotiation time did roll around, General Electric workers well understood why the compensation package might seem moderate compared to some of the all-inspiring packages that workers were getting elsewhere. Now, the last piece of Bulware's approach was perhaps its most controversial. And that was the contract offer, an offer that Lem called a balanced best interest offer, meaning that 
the offer took into consideration all things that GE needed to consider. The wages of the employees, but the cost of products, what was owed to stockholders, etc. Another part of this approach to that Lem added in was that he really despised the usual flow of negotiations. You know how that usually looks, right? So the union comes in and they ask for way more in their compensation than is reasonable. And the company comes in and they offer way less than what is reasonable, only so that the two sides can sort of hem and haul and make their way to a middle ground that everyone knew they were headed for all along. Bulware argues that this dance is a waste of time, but it also had some negative consequences. He said it creates conflict that damages the relationship between the workers and the employers. Lem argues that if an employer comes in and offers this lowball figure, he appears miserly. And even worse, when he does finally settle at the more reasonable figure, which everyone knew all along they were headed to, he gives the appearance that he only went to that figure because the union dragged the extra cash out of him. Therefore, the company doesn't get any credit for the concessions. Instead, the company still looks like they're a miser and the union is celebrated as the heroes who defeated that miser. So Lem wants to put an end to the low ball offer. Instead, when it's time for Lem to put an offer on the table, his first offer is the company's best offer. He argues it includes all of the research into the marketplace and that it includes all of the research he had done into determining what the workers biggest needs were. The controversy with this sort of approach is that when he makes the offer, he doesn't budge from that initial offer. Unions called his approach a take it or leave it strategy, a refusal to engage in bargaining. But Lem countered that he would make changes to the initial offer if the union presented compelling evidence that the offer wasn't fair to everyone. Rarely did General Electric find itself compelled to change. So the first offer, was often the best offer, was often the only offer. And Lem would continue with his marketing machine to convince his employees that the offer was fair, that it was in line with economic principles and a smart buy for GE employees and the company. So when Kerry takes his union out on strike in 1960, the workers had little stomach for the strike because many were convinced thanks to Lem's marketing strategies, that the offer was fair. They have a sense of the economic principles driving it. They prefer to accept the deal rather than engage in a long strike, knowing that there was little chance that Bulware and Day were going to budge. And perhaps also believing that the moderate offer gave the company the best chance to be sustainable in the long term, which was a form of job security in a way. Now, Lemuel Bulware is the architect of this philosophy, but getting back to Virgil Day, he's the messenger. The Virgil Day collection at Hagley, it contains four boxes of Day speeches in which he carries this GE message out to the masses. He educated on economics, explaining that wages that were higher than a company could afford, they're inflationary, and the cost of higher wages would be recovered through higher prices, so the spending power of the high paid wage earner would ultimately be diminished. He wants people to understand that connection and relationship. Day's also out there trumpeting the coming of foreign competition and how cheap labor in emerging markets meant that a radio in Japan could be made less, could be made for less and sold for less because of the cheap labor. So Day's telling the workers that GE radios would get squeezed from the market if its workers were overpaid and its products ended up overpriced. He also sells the value of offering employees stock options. He wants to teach employees that companies' gains were the employees' gains. And GE did work stock options into its contracts as an incentive for its workers. 
Finally, in some of Day's speeches, he's encouraging employees to accept automation, not as a killer of jobs, but as an opportunity to learn new skills and, and advance the economy into the future. Now, Day travels all over the country with these messages. He talks to large groups of General Electric employees, as well as executives at other companies, trying to convince people that the bulware inspired GE approach would save the American economy from inflation, save the American economy from foreign competition, and prepare the economy for the future. Of course, many on the labor side totally disagree with Bulware and Day. Union leaders are gonna argue this approach is too paternalistic. Bulware knows best, not really flying in the rebellious 1960s. They questioned, why do workers have to forego requests for an extra few pennies an hour while executives such as Bulware earned enough salary to retire on beachfront property in Florida. Virgil Day is vacationing in Europe. These two gentlemen didn't build GE. They didn't invent and patent the products. They surely weren't sweating on the factory floor assembling and boxing the goods for sale. So that disparity between the executive salaries and the workers' wages, it made a lot of people grumble. Union leaders also argued that prices didn't necessarily need to rise because wages increased. They argued profits were enough that workers could share in the reward. Passing the cost on to the consumer through higher prices, that seemed to the labor side as corporate greed rather than fairness to everyone. And union leaders also fired back on day's automation claims. They retorted that automation did, incre did create new jobs, but it destroyed far more than it created. So the union felt justified in its attempts to thwart automation efforts. The arguments between Day and labor leaders in the 1950s and 60s probably sounds familiar. It's the same sort of arguments we hear the talking heads today on Fox News and MSNBC having now, right? The challenges of automation or artificial intelligence, and the problems of foreign competition, wage stagnation, and battles over where wages need to begin and end. We still debate these very same issues today. But there is one thing here that we're talking about today that we see far less of now than we did in the days of Bulware and Day. And that's employee strikes. Employee strikes are far less numerous today than they were in the 60s. And General Electric, Bulware and Day, they may be one of the reasons for that. I doubt that you heard of Virgil Day or Lemuel Bulware before today, but these two men had a profound impact on one particular union boss. And that union boss would one day find himself in a very influential position just a few decades later. Now, this union boss wasn't someone Bulwer and Day encountered through typical means. They didn't face him across the negotiations table. He wasn't one of their foes that they sparred with in the press like James Carey. This union leader was instead the host of a television, show, a television program and he was the union boss of the Screen Actors Guild. The program was called General Electric Theater, and that union boss was the host of that program, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, through his involvement with the General Electric Theater, got to know the philosophy and tactics of Lemuel Bulware pretty well. Some historians suggest that Reagan's conservative values were actually born during his tenure on the show. Now, Reagan hosted the show, but he was also during that time the official spokesperson for General Electric. As the official spokesperson for General Electric, he toured hundreds of GE plants and he would speak to thousands of workers. And what did he talk about when he went on these speeches? when he went on these tours and gave these speeches. His speeches 
they echoed the sentiment that Bulware was stuffing into the pay envelopes and hanging on posters around the factories. See, Reagan was a great speaker. And so as part of this campaign to convince its workers of the economic principles at General Electric and what drove employee wages, Reagan was brought in to speak on those, uh, those values and those thoughts and let workers know uh, through his own way what that meant. Now, while Reagan's out there giving these speeches and reinforcing the Bulware message to the workers, some historians have suggested that Reagan started to internalize this message himself. And as president, Reagan is going to face off with a union and a strike. And that is the Federal Air Traffic Controllers strike that he faced in 1981. Rather than give in to the strikers, which was still mostly the norm in 1981, Reagan and his administration play the strike similar to the way Bulwer and Day did in 1960. First of all, they made sure that a walkout of the union workers wasn't going to cripple air traffic control. So before the strike began, they started hustling together military men with experience, retired air traffic controllers, anyone with experience who they could muster into work should the union air traffic controllers go on strike. This is sort of like the GE setup where a particular union strike isn't going to cripple you because you have enough non-union workers and other type of workers at the ready to go. Then Reagan is gonna spin the strikers in a negative light in the press. He casts them as people who are hurting the economy, similar to or, or at least along the lines of what Bulwer and Day argued in their rhetoric. But Reagan is going to take it one step further than Bulwer and Day. He orders everyone in, he orders all the air traffic controllers back to work on the grounds that the offer on the table was fair and anyone who didn't report back to work would be fired and barred from working in the federal government ever again. So Reagan does take it one step additional, but he breaks the strike. And the skies remain mostly open. This strike was largely unsuccessful. Now, many historians point to the air traffic control strike and the president's actions during it as a turning point in the history of labor relations in the United States. When the president takes on the air traffic controllers union and wins, many other business owners feel empowered to start using the same tactics. And, to get workers to accept company offers and remain on the job. The Reagan approach, as we say today, goes viral. And within a year or two, it's being taught in business school curriculums, such as the Wharton School, using the, the Reagan example in the air traffic control case as a how-to approach in dealing with unions and strikes. So strike breaking gets cast as patriotic as a means of keeping the economy chugging along and strikers are cast as being selfish, that they cause inflation, that they expose the US economy to the threat of foreign competition. And it really works. In 1981, there's about 141 strikes on average each year. Today, that average is about 15 per year. So a drastic drop off. What we see is that General Electric approach goes mainstream thanks to Reagan. And for better or worse, yes, it really depends on if you're a corporate executive or a wage earning worker, striking union power, it's all been significantly diminished. That's why we keep these records at the Hagley. If we're to understand why labor relations in the United States are the way they are, we need historical documents to help us understand what took place. And I'm always thrilled that I get the opportunity to prepare these collections for future researchers. Now, if, if you have any additional interest in the people I discussed today, as I noted, we are fortunate to have Virgil Day's papers at the Hagley. The University of Pennsylvania has Lemuel Bulware's papers and Rutgers University has James Carey's papers. Of course, Reagan's papers are at his presidential library in California, 
and I believe that's where all episodes of General Electric Theater are archived. <laughs> I want to thank you for listening to this edition of the Hagley History Hangout. We release a new episode every week, and you can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and on Hagley's own resource page, hagley.org backslash from home. Thanks again. So that went well.